Hello, everybody. A warm welcome to Wisdom from North, the Nordic portal for accelerated inner growth and empowerment. I'm Janneke, and if you're new to my channel, welcome here. I'd love for you to subscribe. You do that below, and if you click the bell, you get notifications of my new videos. Now, I also have a free gift for you. I have a free meditation that's called Meet Your Future Self, and you can find that below. Now, today, I'm really excited about being here with Kate Northrup. Kate is a best-selling author of Do Less and Money, a Love Story. She's also the founder of The Origin Company, where she helps uh, established and aspiring business owners work less while having less stress and create more abundance. And she's also passionate about helping people be more relaxed while having the impact they're supposed to. Now, let's meet Kate. <music> Hello, Kate. How are you? And welcome. I'm wonderful. Thank you. Thanks for having me. I'm really excited about this conversation. I interviewed you or your mother actually a few years ago. And after I started my own company, I got really interested in getting more support and help in how we can get more flow in our workspace. Mm -hmm. And what I've come across is that there are many women, especially who struggle with charging, charging enough or making money, or they might have an assumption that oh, I'm helping other people, I'm being of service, and then um, I can't charge too much, or they have some sort of blockage when it comes to money. And then mm -hmm. I saw this talk you had about it's spiritual to be rich. And that in your own life, you saw that financial issues were related to self-care. And I'm super, super fascinated about that. So let's start there. Uh, how is how is it spiritual to be rich? Well, so first of all, I think we need to define what we mean by rich. And so there are all kinds of types of wealth, types of riches. We have financial, which is an important one. We have health. We have relationships. We have our connection with God or with spirit or with the universe. We have um, our emotional well-being. These are all different kinds of riches. And so the idea that it's not spiritual to be rich is pervasive, especially in spiritual communities. And the idea that's embedded in that is that suffering is more spiritual that somehow uh, things being hard makes you a more holy person. I know that that's been taught in religions overtly and unover in, in overtly, in overtly for millennia, you know, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. But I think we need to question it because at the core of it is control. If you think about you're a religious leader. And listen, if you're a religious person, this is not, I'm not trying. I'm, this is like a general, it is wonderful to go to church. If you go to church, it's wonderful. <laughs> I'm not saying that that's bad or wrong. However, organized religion has had a history of some shady behavior to varying extents. And if you think about being a leader and wanting to control people, it would be a very effective strategy to convince them that the harder their life is, the more spiritual they are. So our commonly cultural held belief that it is more spiritual to suffer was on purpose. A, like there are people who organize that on purpose to keep themselves in power and to disempower the majority. So we just have to know that. And so then when we take that to the next level, then we have this opportunity to really liberate ourselves and say like, 
I can be powerful and happy. And so can everyone else. Like my power, my joy, my well being, my wealth does not take away from others. And it is an opportunity to switch from a zero sum model where we believe there's only so much to go around. And if I have some, it means I'm, I'm automatically taking it from somebody else to a model of abundance where there's more than enough to go around. I mean, our mother nature is the most beautiful model for abundance. Mother nature has enough resources for the plants and the animals and the ecosystem and everything works together. It's just that humans, we have like a hoarding problem. So we have, we have messed with the whole order of things, but at the end of the day, like there's enough oxygen, me breathing doesn't mean you have less oxygen, right? There is actually enough food and resources for everybody. It's just been misallocated. Um, and so it's an opportunity for us Anytime we find ourselves in scarcity thinking around anything, it could be around time, it could be around money, it could be around love, it could be around anything, to tap back into, okay, I exist, so therefore, there's enough, right? Like, my mere presence here is proof that I am meant to be here, which is proof that there must be enough resources for me to thrive because it is our birthright to thrive. We are not meant to suffer. And that is just bad programming. I love that perspective. And that perspective is so important. The way we see things, right? And discover these mind programmings that we've actually had. And I, I know that you were struggling yourself, actually. You worked with your mom and you had some financial struggles yourself. And you also discovered that the the finances is in the second chakra. Uh, I found mm -hmm. that very interesting. What does that mean? Does that mean that we need to work with our second chakra in order to open up to this abundance? Yeah, so there are, you know, for anybody who's not familiar, there are seven energy centers of the body called the chakras. And uh, the second one is the area uh, in your pelvis and your lower back where the reproductive organs are. And so that is your sacral chakra. And that is the area of our body that has to do with the way we relate to money, sex, and power. So those three things are actually tied together they are the way we relate to one of those things is the way we relate to all of those things, which is just interesting to think about. <laughs> um, and so you mean that sex has something to do with finances? Yeah, I mean, our sexual energy is very, it's our life force. It's our creative energy. And in and, and so much of, um, Money is just, it's, it, it really is just energy. Humans made it up. It's not real, right? <laughs> like money is not real. We exchange it in turn for things that we value. Um, but what we value is a deeply emotional sort of energetic thing. It's all, it's, it's not, you know, it's not like tangible. And so, yeah, so the way we relate to money and, and sex and power are all very interrelated. And we think about, you know, historically as women, our power was through our sexuality almost exclusively, right? And our ability to bear children. And now things are changing, right? Of course, but it's so interesting that our ability to have power in the world we, we didn't have access to money. We didn't have control over money, but we, we were valued for um, our ability to give pleasure and our ability to bear children. And so those were currency. And now we have other kinds of currency, but it's all just currency. And I think that's what's important to realize is it's all just currency. It's all things we trade um, in exchange for something we want. And so when we can take it out of like, <gasps> oh my gosh, there's only this amount in my bank account and take it into the greater perspective, then we can participate in the game of it in a much more powerful way and in the energetics of it in a much more powerful way. Makes sense. And how is our finances connected to our own self-care? 
Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we receive money in exchange for creating value in the world, right? For doing something or providing a product or a service that somebody values. And then in exchange for that, they give us money. Now, somebody who is not valuing themselves very highly will have more trouble charging for their services, asking for a raise, negotiating for a higher, you know, for a higher package, compensation package. Our self-worth is not in any way equated to our net worth, but they are related. So just, you know, if you don't have much money in the bank, it doesn't mean you're not a valuable person at all, but it does have to do with our relationship with ourselves. So when we begin to take better care of ourselves and we begin to fill our own cup, often our financial reality begins to shift. And for me, I really saw financial management as a chore, as something that was really hard, as something that was boring, as something that I didn't understand. But when I began to take care of my money as part of like, it's like, it was over here. My personal finances were over here and self-care was over here. But when I put personal finance in the category of self-care and I treated it the same as um, getting a pedicure or meditation or like I needed to recategorize it. And when I was, when I did that, my financial reality changed dramatically. I was able to pay off $25,000 in debt in uh, under a year and double my income. And it wasn't because I got a new job. <laughs> it wasn't be, it wasn't because somebody came along and gave me a bunch of money. It was an energetic shift that then changed the circumstances in my life. And so that's how self-care is related to money. That's interesting. And in this talk that I saw, I, I thought it was so interesting. Um, you also talked about some uh, financial practices that we can do to look at what we spend money on and see, was that an expensive uh, purchase or did I contract? Um, that's an interesting question. Uh, I'm about to invest in something huge and I, I'm practicing trying to find out, is this expensive or contractive? But I think it is expensive. Uh, <sighs> could you take us through that exercise, how, that, how we can use that? Yeah. So I, you know, I will also say since that talk, um, I've learned a lot more about human design, which I don't know if you've studied human design at all, but there are different types of, of human design and, and different des, uh, decision-making centers. So if somebody you're listening and you don't know what I'm talking about, just look up human design and you can do a, a very easy, quick, free, you know, what's my human design. And there's a wonderful app called my human design. The reason I am telling you this is because I found out that the way I teach is based on my design. So I'm going to teach from that perspective, but just know if you're listening to this and you're like, that doesn't make sense. It's not because there's something wrong with my method and it's not because there's something wrong with you. It just means there are different ways of experiencing something and you may need a different way in, but I'm going to share it with you. Okay. So um, our bodies tell us often what is what is right for us and what is not. Now those signals show up in, in different ways for different people. For me, it's just like this physical knowing. I either get a feeling of expansion and a yes, or a feeling of contraction and it feels like heavy and dark. And so when you, you can become attuned to this by looking at your credit card statement or your bank statement or what, wherever you do most of your charges and go through item by item and ask yourself each one, think back to the time you actually spent that money. Or if it's an automatic transaction, you can just think about that thing that you received in exchange for the money and notice 
what your body does. Just notice what sensations arise. Do they feel more expansive and light and open? Or does it feel more contracted and heavy and dark and closed? So the expansive ones are, we want the energy of expansion around our money, right? Not the energy of contraction and closing down. And so you can look at that retroactively just to bring more consciousness. And then of course, like you said, as you're looking at more expenditures or investments, you can think about it ahead of time. My husband and I also just made a big investment. And as we were doing it, it felt so open and exciting and like all these possibilities. But I have spent money before where it just was like, like it does have some, but I feel like I have to, or this person is expecting it, or this is just what people do or right. Like all of those things. So you also want to pay attention to the inner dialogue and actually ask yourself. So if it's like, well, I just have to do this. You need to ask yourself whose voice is that? Like specifically, who is saying that? It's not just, it's never just like, I have to do this, right? We have to ask who is actually saying that and get down to whose voice to get clarity on why we're actually behaving the way we are because we make money is an incredibly emotional topic. We make decisions always based on our emotions and then we back them up with our prefrontal cor cortex, our logical mind. But always, always, always decisions are made in the part of our brain related to our emotions. And so we just have to be conscious of them. It doesn't mean that's bad. It does mean we need to bring consciousness to it. Yeah, very interesting and helpful that you're saying be specific about that voice, but it, because it could be your father or mother who says that's a very sensible what? thing to do. And it could be like a random friend from high school on Instagram who you're like thinking is judging you. I mean, sometimes you get down to it and it's like, wow, I can't believe I am actually making this decision based on that voice. I want to jump over to something uh, else because we're going to speak about how we can do less and uh, mm -hmm. possible misunderstandings about what that means. And also, I know that you work with feminine energy and uh, sort of look at our the moon cycle or menstrual cycle to see how we can get more flow in our work lives. And I just saw a, a short clip, I, I think it was on Instagram, where you spoke about egg wisdom and as a woman i found that so interesting that you put those words together eggs and wisdom so i'd love for you to share a bit about what you shared in that clip about how our eggs are having this wisdom to actually pick out the sperm that's right for them yes yeah, so egg wisdom was originally coined by my mother christian northrup so this is not my concept it's something she taught me and she told me it's fine if I keep sharing it with the world. So I just want to be clear that I didn't make this up. Um, so egg wisdom is the biological blueprint for creation. But I want to be clear. This is I'm going to share. I'm going to tell you what happens biologically. But this is a metaphor, right? So this is not if you are somebody listening and you don't have ovaries or you don't have a menstrual cycle uh, because you never did or you whatever, no matter your age, no matter your gender, it, no matter your anatomy, it doesn't matter. This is how all of our bodies were formed. So this wisdom and this energy is available to all of us. So here's how it works. Once a month, the uh, in with a uh, person who has a period, who ovulates, an egg is released from the ovary. And that egg sits in the fallopian tube and it puts out a very strong, very specific signal to let the sperm know where it is. Now the egg knows what she wants. She knows that she's very clear that she is looking for a sperm but she's not actually looking for it. She just sits and trusts by putting out her signal that the sperm will know where she is because that's what the signal does. 
Now, if there are sperm present at that time, the hormonal signal that the egg puts out has the ability to speed up the rate at which the sperm swim to her. So not only does it let them know where she is, it speeds up the rate that her desire is getting to her. So her clarity and her trust are very important. Now, once the sperm get there, we've all seen the videos, right? Where like all the sperm are banging their heads against the, the egg. And it looks like the strongest sperm is the one that gets in. But what is actually true is that the egg is choosing. So she has great boundaries and knows what is not right for her, but she is also open and receptive to what is right for her. So she lets in just the sperm or the sperms in the case of multiples that are right for her. And once they, once she's been fertilized, once the sperm is in, she has the ability to repair the DNA if there's anything wrong with that sperm. So she has the ability to improve upon actually her desire once it gets there. And that really is the feminine principle. Like we know that um, when feminine energy is present, things are more delicious, they're more comfortable, they're more beautiful. Um, it's, it, it's the same reason why it seems like all the good ones are taken. Like when uh, it is, it is true. The data is just shows it that when a man is married, his lifespan increases and his health increases uh, because the principle of the feminine is to improve upon <laughs> what it encounters. So that's egg wisdom. And then the egg has enough nutrients to uh, feed the egg and the sperm as they make their several day journey down the fallopian tube to embed in the cell lining of the uterine, I mean, sorry, in the uterine lining of the uterus and, and then start feeding on that. So she it has a very clear desire. She doesn't go running all around like, where's the sperm? Da -da -da. Oh my God, is it going to come? She doesn't go down to the cervix and check. And like, she just sits and she stays, she puts out her signal. She only lets in what is right for her and keeps everything else out. She improves upon her desire once it shows up and she always has the nourishment. She brings snacks. And so that is egg wisdom. And when we're, when we're going after something in our lives, we really want to ask ourselves, am I being the egg right now or am I being the sperm? And it doesn't mean one is bad or good. Both are necessary. However, our culture is over identified with being sperm like as the only good way to be like run wildly and swim as fast as you can towards what you want and try to beat everyone else like that's sperm wisdom right? and there is a place for that however in our in in this time in life in history we need more of the wisdom of the egg more trust more stillness and uh more more ability to discern what is and what is not right for us. Wow, that is so fascinating. What a, what a perspective and really inspiring. And I think it can also be transferred to what you said in our lives, how we go about um, manifesting things and especially for women, how we go about dating, right? Yeah. So <laughs> perhaps it can be transferred to that. Absolutely. Mm. Fascinating. So let's talk about how we can do less. I'm very curious about that. Uh, perhaps we can look at some misunderstandings. Do less to me uh, makes me a bit nervous because uh, on my to-do list, there's so much to do. And I also get this accomplishment feeling when I've done all the things on my to-do list and I feel a bit like <sighs> tired. <laughs> yeah. This so yeah, great. what, what uh, how can we do less and get as much as I need to get done? Yeah, so doing less, just to be clear, a lot of people are sort of put off by that concept and, and title of the book. And just to be clear, uh, what happens is a lot of people hear do less and then they hear do nothing. <laughs> so they just immediately are like, I can't sit on the beach and just, you know, drink margaritas all day. Like I have a mortgage to pay. I have, I have mouths to feed. I have whatever. And um, so just to be clear, like I also 
have all those financial responsibilities. And so doing less is not about doing nothing. It's about doing less of the things that don't matter so that you can have more time and energy for the things that do. It's about being mindful with our time and our attention and our energy and knowing that, for example, we don't expect a flower to bloom all year. We know that a flower has seasons and cycles. We too are nature. We are animals. We are made of the very same stuff as the trees, the flowers, the animals. And we have to know that we too have seasons and cycles. So it's not about never doing anything. It's not about not doing the things on your to-do list. And it's not about letting anybody down because that's the other thing that people hear is, well, I can't do less. Everything will fall apart, right? Like uh, my career will fall apart. No one's going to get the laundry done, like, uh, da, 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 right? <laughs> and we have to really be then begin to identify and start to look at are the amount to which we, our identity is wrapped up in what we accomplish. And I think it is a really helpful question to ask, who would I be if I was not productive? Who would I be if I wasn't productive? Who would I be if I wasn't capable? How much of me, am I lovable because I'm capable? Am I worthy because I check everything off my to-do list? Am I, do I get to exist because I'm productive? No, we are all infinitely valuable creations and we get to exist no matter what. And we also get to love getting things done. I love getting things done. <laughs> I mean, I am absolutely one of those people and I have big ambitions and big dreams. And so what we need to do is not just haphazardly allow everything onto our plate, everyone else's priorities, everyone else's expectations of us, everyone else's, this is what you should do. And instead get really tuned in with our own intuition, our own seasons of, and cycles. Where are we um, in our own season of growth, business-wise or career-wise? Is this a time for planting new seeds? Is this a time for initiating? Is this a time for full bloom? Is this a time for harvesting? Is this a time for culminating and, and weeding and pruning? Is this a time for laying fallow? And know that our culture has brainwashed us to believe that the only valuable way of being is getting things going and launching them right? Like visible results are the only thing that matter. But actually nature gives us a model to look at that, wow, we have spring and we have summer, which are beautiful seasons. And it's like, things are in full bloom. Things are growing. It's amazing. High energy, a lot of sunshine. And then we also have autumn and winter. And without autumn and winter, spring and summer would not exist. They're all incredibly important and each season has its own gifts. So when we expect ourselves to be all spring and summer energy all month long, especially if you are somebody with a menstrual cycle, that's just not in alignment with how your biology works and how your hormones work. Um, but regardless, all of us need to be thinking more in terms of seasonal and less in terms of let me be the same every day. Let me check off everything on my to-do list every day. And if I'm anything less than that, then I'm doing it wrong. That's really the toxic part. Interesting. Um, so can you give some practical uh, examples on when, or, or are there specific times where it's good to launch, for example, something like when the moon is full or not full or new uh, and for seasons also, uh, I mean, winter is about, especially in Norway, like it's cold, where we're drawing. Are we not supposed to launch things then and start something new? Do we have to sort of wait to spring or how yeah, complete so is it? It doesn't work quite like that. It's like a lot more subtle. 
<laughs> because in our modern world, it, it, it's it's not practical to say, okay, don't launch all winter, right? It's just not practical. So, so um, instead it's to honor how we feel. And I recommend starting if you are somebody who has a menstrual cycle with your own menstrual cycle, because it dictates so much of how you feel. And we have been robbed of this precious information. We've been told, you know, either you need a tampon or don't get pregnant. Like that's like basically, or here's the day you need to get pregnant. Like that's all the information we've been given, but actually our menstrual cycle is a microcosm every month. Our menstrual cycle is a microcosm of the four seasons. So we have our follicular phase is the week or so after we have a period. That's our personal springtime. We have a personal summertime. That's around the time of ovulation. We have a personal autumn. That's the luteal phase. That's the 10 to 12 days before you get your period. And that's your autumn. We have a personal winter every month. That's when we have our period. This is mimicked, of course, by the lunar cycle. So not that you would get your period on the new moon necessarily. That's not, I mean, that might happen, but it's not like bad or good or better. Um, but just to know that these seasons and cycles are happening all the time. So yes, aligning your workflow with your menstrual cycle to the degree that you can would be amazing. So for example, when I'm having my period, I'm not going to book myself back to back with Zoom calls all day where I'm like doing interviews or speaking in front of a lot of people. It's just my energy is low. I want to be internal. And that's a time where the gift of that personal season is intuition and reflection. We go inside to hear ourselves better. And our brains are actually the most wired for interconnection between our left and right hemispheres while we have our period. So it is literally the best time for intuition. You'll get clarity on things that you couldn't get clarity on the whole rest of the month. And so we can do some of that, right? It's great to initiate projects when you're in your follicular phase. It's great to be in public and be visible and be networking when you're ovulating. It's great to be doing detail work and like odds and ends and bookkeeping and analytics and things like that and completing things when you're in your luteal phase. However, we can't always organize ourselves right that, like that, right? Because like life marches on and I don't know about you, but sometimes my period comes one or two days. Like it's not, it's not like, okay, it's not on the button. And so what instead we can do is begin to learn what is the nature of each phase for us. And then how can we go about what we have scheduled at that time with reverence to the energy we're experiencing? So for example, I am on day 26 of my cycle. So I'm about to get my period. I feel kind of a little more prickly and like right, right before you get your period is the time when your neg negativity filter is much higher. And, and it's the time when you look at everything in your life to see if it's working or if it's not. And it feels like things, uh, as my friend Deb says, Deb Kern, she says, you can trust your feelings. You just can't trust the volume of them. <laughs> so at this time, we can trust that like our husband is irritating us and, you know, we're spending too much time with our kids and like the team isn't doing this, that, or the other thing. Like that's all true, but we just have to know that before you get your period, that's like so much more intense. So it doesn't mean don't trust it. It just means, oh, like make a note of that. And then when you get your period, you can go inside and really ask like, is there something I need to do about this in this next, in this next cycle? So, you know, I, knowing that I feel like a little more prickly and whatever, I actually find that during my luteal phase is a great time to write copy because I have less of a filter for caring what the world thinks. So I write better during this time because I'm just like, listen, this is just what I think, take it or leave it. Um, so I get, I get things done quicker because I'm not having like so much, I just don't care what people think this during this time. So we can take, we can get to know ourselves. And I created something called 
the daily energy tracker so that you can get to know like really, really beautifully and really specifically, who am I during these different phases? And then how can I optimize my life and my business to support who I am, as opposed to what we've always been taught, which is, this is how you should be, do everything you can to be more like this. Makes so much sense. And I love that you have like um, some help for that, like this daily um, emotional, what it was, uh, because uh, to me, I, I haven't been so observative of uh, my menstrual cycle. Uh, I, I started becoming more observative the latest years because I discovered that, oh, you know, uh, there's wisdom in this. Uh, I, I, because I, I think this is something we are starting to talk more about now. We didn't before. And I've also felt that I've been very emotional uh, right before my menstruation and another cycle I wasn't. So I've been feeling it's so random and I always have one really bad day. Uh, and lately I've really become more comfortable with that. Like you're saying that you're feeling something, but the volume has just been turned yeah. up so much. Uh, but So are you saying that there's a general sort of way of the faces, but then it's very individual as well. And we got to know yeah. our individual. You have to know yourself yeah. because mm. no one, you know, we have been so taught that somebody else knows better than we do. And at the end of the day, you are always going to be the best authority on your body and your own lived experience. And we need to stop farming that out to our doctors or to Google or to apps or, you know, all those things are wonderful and they only need to serve to back up or, or um, enhance your own experience of you. No one else can tell you what it is to be you. You have to learn what it is to be you. And then, and, and then use that power to create a life and a business that supports the truth of who you are. Mm, beautiful. And how has your life changed after you started using these feminine principles and doing less? Yeah, so... Um, this, it all happened quite by accident. Uh, when I got pregnant with my first daughter, I have never been so tired as I was in my, I mean, it was just, wow. I was just knocked out. And prior to that time in my life, I had never had an experience where I couldn't overcome something by just trying harder, just by putting in more effort, right? I've always been an athlete. I'm very physically strong. And it was so disorienting to not feel capable for the first time in my life. And so my body just made me rest. I mean, I was probably, I was working less than half the amount of time I had worked previously and I just was sleeping all the time, I had no energy. And then when my daughter was born, um, I had a, you know, kind of a surprising birth experience that I, I didn't expect. It was very, you know, kind of rocky and tumultuous. and. Um, I struggled after her birth with postpartum insomnia and postpartum depression, uh, not depression, anxiety, uh, mastitis, nursing issues. And then she got really sick and had severe eczema and was waking up, you know, sometimes every 10 minutes at night screaming and making herself bloody from scratching herself. So the first year of parenthood just was terrible for me. So sweet with the baby. I was thrilled to have her. However, it was just not what I had expected. And it, you know, it was what I needed, right? Because I needed to be transformed in terms of how I related to work. During that time, my husband and I had only 10 hours of childcare a week because I, for some reason, thought, like, I can run my whole company in 10 hours a week. No. <laughs> so, but what was so fascinating you know, and newborns do sleep a lot. So there was some more time than that. Um, they sleep a lot during the day. I didn't find that mine slept a lot at night. <laughs> at the end of the year, we sat down and we realized we had made more money that year than we had ever made before, despite working less than half the amount of time we had ever worked in our adult lives. And so that was the moment for me when I thought, why have I been working so many hours when I could have gotten better results 
by working far less and doing less. So I was doing plenty. I was raising a newborn and feeding her. And I mean, that was a lot of work, but in terms of the business, I had automatically implemented the 80, 20 rule. I knew, you know, I automatically knew what was the 20% that was going to get 80% of the results. And so when the baby went down, I just did that 20%, right? I got so clear on my priorities. I got so clear on my boundaries. I was so focused because I had no other option. It was sink or swim. And so I looked at that and I thought, well, I don't want to ever go through a year like this again, because this was terrible, but (laughs) I would love to see if I could implement some of these strategies ongoing. And so that's how this work came to be. And since implementing these strategies, um, we were able to hit our first seven figure year very quickly after that, despite having tried for years and years and years to hit that goal, able to maintain that and grow it a little bit while having another baby. And while my husband has been on and off uh, having a chronic illness. So we've been one man down quite a bit at the time. Um, and also really been able to touch into and tap into the work that I know that I was meant to do, like really landing on my purpose, really knowing, you know, I am living my Dharma. I am doing what I was meant to do. And so opportunities come right in a way that they didn't before when I felt like I was just playing business, but it was tapping into my own seasons and cycles and these feminine energy practices that got me reconnected to source and helps also tap into, you know, I, I, you know, there's, there's like the things that we do, right. The emails we send and the DMS we did on the calls we make. Right. And then there's also this whole other thing happening. And so that web of opportunity and web of connection and the energetic piece, I was able to just like get access to that in a way I couldn't before. Cause I, I was pretty disconnected, you know, we, when we connect to some to one thing, we really connect to everything because I believe that our bodies and our our souls are a microcosm of sort of the the great all that there is. Wow, that is so inspiring, Kate. And I hope that many uh, who are inspired today will go and check out the Origin Company and everything you do there because I really think you are a pioneer, and that this is the future. And that we can create so much more ease. And it's just so hopeful to me to listen to this because there are some tweaks that I can also do and to get the, to know that there's support out there and that it is not just a great idea that it's actually working. Um, oh yes. Yeah. So practical. I am, I, I do love talking about philosophy and theory, but everything I teach is super practical because if you can't use it on the daily basis and if you can't see the results pretty quickly, why bother? Right, makes sense. Thank you so much for your time and for the beautiful work you're doing and for being here today with us. Thanks for having me. And thank you for watching everybody. Much light from Norway and the US. Bye-bye.